combined mix. Uh, Rastish contacted me actually quite some time ago because uh, he has been working on Twitter, which is obviously of interest to many of us as well, uh, about potential collaborations. And uh, then the pandemic came and uh, uh, we postponed this seminar, but yeah, hoping to, to be able to have a live seminar, but yeah, it's uh, uh, it still isn't possible. So we decided to do it now anyway. So uh, as you guess, Rastish, uh, are interested in potential collaborations. So he'll give his talk first, but then we'll have a discussion session where we can discuss uh, pot potential opportunities and other things as well. So, yeah, so welcome. Um, thank you. Um, so can everyone hear me fine? Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so the uh, sort of the initial part will be recorded and it'll be on YouTube. Um, um, so if you don't want to be uh, there, then don't say anything or anonymize yourself, but we can have a discussion without the recording later on. But please feel free to ask questions. So it's extremely important that we sort of do the right jazz to dynamically pitch to you, right? So that's very important to ask questions as well. So the title is essentially uh, the polarized state of the Swedish political Twitterverse. And this is sort of um, in light of what uh, one could call lessons from um, this mathematical statistical projection called ideological forests. And it's hate because it's focused on the US Southern Poverty Law Center definition of a hate group in the United States. And this centers around the 2016 US presidential election. Um, what I think um, I will try to do is uh, the first part is mainly about this uh, study that's published in a particular journal. Uh, these are, I guess, computational sociologists that do network mining type stuff. So it's a, it's a different audience. It's pitched for them. Uh, but the part one also is um, uh, the, this particular set of slides is actually for a more of a, um, a computational mathematical audience as well. So, um, so the, the, the sort of title of part one is uh, Scalably Vertex Programmable Ideological Forests from Certain Political Twitter Verses and uh, sort of explain what they mean in, a, in, a, in some, some appropriate level of detail. But basically what scalably means is that we can process terabytes of data uh, that come from social media interactions, right? At, at scale, that's uh, what that means, so big data. Vertex programmable just means that these, uh, these streams of data of live interactions can be represented as a, a graph, a mathematical graph with nodes and directed edges. And then there is a programming paradigm called vertex programming that allows you to, to process this kind of uh, encoding of massive data. And the scalability and vertex programmability are sort of important because the underlying maybe mathematical and possibly industrial motivations are only refraining yourself to computational tools that allow you to do what one would consider uh, observational and also Markov control operations on these data. That means this, for example, includes sort of evil things like um, manipulating people's emotions to change the, the, the clades in the forest through time and things like this, right? So, um, and then we will sort of look at, so we've done this in some English speaking countries before the 2019 uh, the, the, the Swedish election. Uh, we did in the US and UK and also New Zealand. Um, so the questions are um, um, basically uh, very, very simple. This work was mainly done with uh, social psychologists. So they were interested in intergroup bias and things like this. And then we formulated that as a statistical hypothesis test because they, I guess, believe they're scientists. So, and then we wanted to make sure that the experimental design is customizable. So it's replicable in other uh, contexts like other national elections and so on. The data and statistics uh, are mainly experimental design involving using Twitter's streaming and REST API. And of course, Twitter was chosen for many legal reasons. Unlike Facebook, uh, it's not a garden of Eden. Everything is public. Of course, you have to follow the rules and stuff. 
but uh, that was the main reason we chose Twitter. And unfortunately, yes, Twitter is not a representation of everyone in the population chosen at random, but that's the brains. Um, then I will do models and methods and then some results. And um, the basic arithmetic game here is statistical hypothesis testing and estimation while limiting oneself to scalable so-called fault tolerant distributed programs. Fault tolerant means uh, you're doing these programs on a cloud of computers, like say Google Cloud with, I don't know, thousands of machines and some public cloud. Uh, it's fault tolerant because as you're computing, machines are allowed to fail at the hardware level, but the computation are guaranteed to continue. Right? So that's the, um, uh, that restriction is just to make sure that it's applicable in uh, sort of you know, problems. So then question one that we asked is, is Donald Trump in the 2016 US presidential election preferentially retweeted, right? Retweet is a shared like, uh, retweeted by various types of hate groups or their leadership relative to other politicians, right? So these were uh, Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, and Ted Cruz and Paul Ryan. They were sort of other contenders. Uh, and then this is uh, this hypothesis test is against the sort of null random network model that we formalize as apathetic retweeting. I mean, it's just a straw man model, but something. Uh, question two is the, the, what frequency of unique users retweeted both a politician and a hate group or its leadership more than expected under the null model? Okay, so that's the second question. And the third question is, what is the joint distribution, this is joint probability distribution, of the degrees of separation, right? This is simply uh, how many, to, uh, you know, how many, how many people that uh, you have to follow in a retweet set of chain uh, to reach uh, a particular uh, original tweeter, right? So I'll explain all of this in more detail. So, but the question is, what is the joint distribution of the degrees of separation to each user from each of the five politicians and the eight most prolific hateful ideologies on Twitter? And this joint distribution is measured through the lengths of the most retweeted directed paths in the observed network. So it's uh, essentially the, the fundamentals, the statistic of this raw data is what is uh, essentially guiding these ideological trees and forests later on. And of course, this is sort of at the time was interesting. Did the US hate networks get help from Russian trolls, right? Um, so anyway, this is basically back to basics in big data age scientific hypothesis testing. Um, so Twitterverse, for those of you who don't know Twitter, it's a microblogging service. So a tweet is basically a status update. A retweet is a shared like, which is also a status update. So all these are status updates in Twitter terminology. So someone tweets and then you can reply to their tweet. You can uh, retweet it. Uh, a tweet can contain links, uh, you know, what sources it uses, hashtags and so on. You can mention other users in your tweet. Uh, you can basically um, follow different users. So every time a user does a status update that you're following, you will get it in your timeline and so on and so forth. So um, of course, Donald Trump used Twitter uh, until the, the last few moments of his presidency uh, to, you know, to, I don't know, um, have a very noticeable influence on US politics. So the public streams and the REST APIs we collected are sort of 22 million status updates re rel related to the five politicians, 52 hate groups. And then we also have to do something we can think of as rest retrospective sort of these um, REST API uh, based network augmentations. So, and then we made sure that our experimental design is limited to the exact uh, possibilities that say a Boko Haram researcher with laptops and solar panel can do. Um, so we didn't want to basically pay Twitter uh, any money, uh, so we only use the free data, right? So the idea is also the Markov control operations can be done by anyone, right? Without necessarily having to pay for the data that's being you know, hosted on Twitter. So that was an important thing. So here we have uh, sort of this particular study. We have US hate groups by Southern Poverty Law Center, and you can look into this. Uh, we just have to make it very precise that the definition of hate group, these words are just this one, 
The Southern Poverty Law Center does not necessarily consider all groups or individuals on its extremist files as violent or engaged in criminal activities, but rather identifies any group or individual whose beliefs or practices attack or malign an entire class of people typically for their immutable characteristics. So that's the sort of legal definition of hate we will use. And of course, this is USSPLC's idea. So this database does not include foreign hate groups or extremist groups like ISIS, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, and so on. And its focus is on American hate groups, right? So, okay, there is an active hate group monitors and things like this. So this is like a few years old. So this is from 2017, these things. Um, and there is quite a lot of, um, you know, crimes against, you know, committed by hate groups. It's way more than this now. Um, um, but yeah, there are sort of 18 U.S. hateful ideologies at that time listed by SPLC. It's alternative right, anti-immigrant, anti-LGBT, anti-Muslim, anti-government, uh, black separatist, Christian. That's like Louis Farrakhan um, stuff. Uh, Christian identity, general hate, Holocaust denial, Ku Klux Klan, neo-confederate, neo-Nazi, and so on, racist music, racist skinhead. Okay, so there's quite a lot, uh, white nationalists and so on. So now um, the US presidential election, the, the Twitter stream, so this is sort of a, a, a sort of live dashboard visualization of what was happening um, um, in this particular, um, um, you know, collection. This is, I think, uh, around the third U.S. presidential debate. There's quite a lot of activity. So it's 120 uh, status updates per second in the Twitter's public uh, streaming APIs that anyone can listen for free. And that's, uh, you know, and because of the way we did our experimental design, we are capturing almost everything in our designed experiment, right? And of course, this is 140 events per second when the last, you know, so around the last two days and then when the election results were announced. So that's the kind of input data that, uh, you know, set into this, uh, in, in, in the stream, in the public streams. So, and then the 12 SPLC defined hateful ideologies have, um, you know, I don't know, there's uh, uh, the number of followers at that time, you know, so anti-government has, has a lot and others have, you know, less. Um, so, and then uh, we basically are looking here at uh, the, the number of followers. Um, so, and then the five prominent politicians in, in, in the USA are uh, some, you know, this is sort of their basic retweet network statistics. So, so what's a retweet network from all of this data? It's basically, you take each status update and then one projection is you look at uh, Donald Trump and any original tweet he made, and then you essentially, look at all the users that retweeted any of his tweets in this period. And uh, you just simply put an integer on the edge if, um, if Donald Trump was retweeted by a particular user, say 85 times in this, in this uh, nine week period. So you, you basically get this very simple uh, network. And then you can ask, what is the um, network statistics of these five political accounts? So here, um, the in degree, in neighborhood, out degree, and out neighborhood. So out degree is the number of um, uh, retweets, uh, retweeters, um, sorry, the number of retweets made uh, off an original tweet of Donald Trump. And then out neighborhood is the number of uh, unique retweeters you know, users who uniquely retweeted. So for Kill Hillary and Donald, like there's, you know, in, because we designed the experiment to have like an equal representation, uh, the sample, um, they have roughly, you know, 950,000 uh, unique users that retweet them. But of course you can see Donald Trump's uh, user base followers are retweeting twice as more intensely on average than, than Hillary. And of course, the other politicians had some, some following as well. So just a quick projection of the, of the retweet network. Um, so of course, you know, there's this only retweet, which is uh, about 10 million in total. And from the full data, there's sort of reply tweet, original tweet, coded tweet, and retweet of a coded tweet, and reply of a coded tweet. So all of these, what we call a reply of a coded tweet is uh, absolutely SQL interrogatable, according, you know, at the lowest level. So. We, we do our own um, SQL logic for based on the pure raw um, JSON uh, blobs that Twitter throws at you, right? 
because it, these these relationships change as Twitter evolves its uh, interaction spaces and there, can, there are other interaction types than this. But what I want to point out is we avoided NLP uh, like a plague here because it's way too complex to bring the NLP layer. I, it's way too complex. For example, in a reply tweet, you don't know if the user is replying out of like support and love or like completely like going crazy, right? So we only looked at retweet for now and sort of uh, just didn't even look at what they are exchanging uh, in some sense. And of course, that's the most interesting part. And, and I hope, um, you know, yeah, you, some, you know, people with your expertise can do something more interesting. So there's basically 4.4 million distinct retweet pairs. So this is the original tweeter and retweeter. These are the users. And then there is 2.7 million uh, tweets, 13.7 uh, million retweets, and 22 million status updates in total. Uh, 2.5 million unique users. So here is some Spark SQL. I won't go too much into a lot of these details. So there is an open source project called uh, Project MEP, Meme Evolution Program. And it's been supported for quite a long time. Originally, the project was supported for research in mathematical biology, where we were studying pedigree processes. Uh, supported by the French Museum of Natural History. Now the trees and forests we are studying are in ideological spaces instead of biological spaces of uh, inheritance, right? So, but it's the same sort of problem mathematically in some sense. Uh, and so a lot of these logics and what's a tweet anatomy and transmission tree, these are all uh, in libraries one can use. Um, so a typical table of this, a quick summary may look like uh, the, the original post user screen name and the retweet or the the uh, original post user ID um, and so on. You can look at favorite counts. See, these are just very small projections of the actual status update, which has a lot more detail. So in this example, uh, the, the, this is a retweet of uh, Donald Trump and Donald Trump said China is cooking up conspiracy theories that the Olympics are rigged, okay? And there's a URL entities that are there and so on. And I don't know, somebody here, uh, George Feiner, retweeted this, right? So this is kind of the, how the data looks like. Okay, so Trump-Clinton retweet network is weighted by retweet counts. So I've been sort of spending more time on these tables because this is kind of the projection of the raw data. Um, so this is what I meant by, uh, so you simply count how many times uh, a user um, um, retweeted another user uh, and, and then the edge simply counts uh, the number of retweets. So these are, you know, some users, and this is uh, retweeters of Trump and Hillary. This is some D3 Interact frozen screenshot. And it's quite complex and it changes by day, and uh, it's a lot going on, right? So, just I'm showing some pictures. Um, and these are, you cannot visualize all of it. These are just 5% random samples. And it's, uh, yeah, like Tony Lauren, like there's, you know, when the TV show turns on, of course, you know, there's a lot going on. So, um, all right. Now, the reason to kind of talk more about the data is that's way too complex and we're doing super simple things because we want to do some hypothesis testing. So the, the simplest models for the sort of ideological network dynamics or whatever you want to um, abstract this into uh, is something so simple like you have arcs, directed arcs, and we say I ideologically concurs with J. Uh, you know, this is a mathematically defined notion of ideological concurrence. All, all that means is, uh, you know, I retweets J, right? And of course, there's a lot of details underneath what this means. But in the Twitter research community, a retweet is considered a sort of clear signal of some kind of concurrence, okay? Um, so, um, yeah, so the problem is we can't really study this, uh, you know, in, in full exhaustion, even the simple stuff, because the, you know, just uh, two retweet networks, uh, um, you know, these are just two, two retweet networks out of a really, really large number of networks just for nine individuals. So we cannot do anything, even at this simplification, we cannot do anything exhaustively. By that I mean, you know, actually simulate and, and and actually study these objects formally in the space. So, um, so then we have to somehow still do hypothesis test and get a p-value. So this is classical frequentist tradition. So how do we do this? That's kind of the problem. So we want the in-degree and out-degree uh, conditioned random networks 
uh, to preserve observed heterogeneity. So what this is, is basically in this field at that time, there was this basic problem that uh, when you look at these retweet networks, you have to account for the fact that some users are way more active inherently by their nature than other users, right? So, uh, so this is basically, an, you know, heterogeneity of this network, which is just a statistical projection of all of this raw status of data interactions. So then now, so when we do a null hypothesis test, we, we need to really account for this. So one way to account for this is to ensure that the in degree, the number of incoming arcs into any user and the out degree, which is the number of outgoing arcs. Um, so who, uh, yeah, who you are tweeting and who uh, you're being retweeted by, that number should be fixed, right? Then we are somehow accounting for the activity level of each user. And so that's the sort of null hypothesis. And we call this the apathetic retweet network. Uh, and formally, this is a classical random directed configuration model. Those of you who are into network science uh, or random graphs. So it, it's, a, it's a model that exists. It's not something you need to invent. It's very, very classical. But the trick is we need to somehow produce uh, lots of samples from this very, very large uh, network, not just with nine individuals, but for the actual, actual network, okay? Um, so then the question is, how do you do this, right? So that's essentially uh, the more sort of mathematical part of the talk. I'm going to maybe skip some of these, um, you know, I'm just trying to show some more statistics about some, some kind of complexity here. Um, so, so the classical thing people were doing at this time in um, computational sociology, uh, uh, it would be like the classical methods like chi-square test and so on. And there's nothing wrong with chi-square test. It's just that the chi-square test uh, may not account for uh, the network heterogeneity effects that uh, you know, need to be considered. Right? So you can do a chi-square test and of course you get a very significant p-value and here you're simply um, yeah, just asking whether uh, the, the, the number of retweeters of, of Trump, um, you know, also are retweeters of a given particular ideology, right? So, and then our, because this question is basically whether people who retweet Trump versus Hillary uh, more often retweet a particular hate group or not. So you can do a chi-square test and it looks okay. But then the criticism is, well, this doesn't account for the uh, network heterogeneity. So then what do you do? So you, you just do some very simple things. So this uh, idea originally is due to Ronald Fisher. It's called the generalized Fisher's exact test, but we're just moving the test into the space of networks. Right? So the, the idea is that you have a tweeter and a retweeter. So they're the users. And then uh, this, uh, you know, there's a retweet. So, you know, this retweeter retweets this tweeter, right? So, and then this is essentially the, the simplest way to look at the data uh, is directed edges between two columns. And then this is just the multi-edged uh, self-loop retweet network representation. This is this, exactly the same as this. It's just drawn in a network structure. So now we somehow want to sample from this uh, directed multi-edged self-loop configuration model. And we want to sample so that, um, uh, so that when we produce a random graph, based on the raw data, we get multiple samples from the null, null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is actually, um, yeah, is that this random graph that we observe is a uniformly distributed realization of the space. Right? So then the idea is simple, you do cut, you take the raw data, you know, and then the retweet network, and then simply cut it. And then in the next step, you permute it, you just simply permute this randomly. And then uh, you rewire after the permutations, right? So you just rewire means connect it again. So this is an algorithm due to Strogatz and Watts, uh, and, um, and you know, and then so we're just using exactly their algorithm. The only trick is you need to be able to do it in a scalable way, so that if you have uh, arbitrarily large number of retweets, then you can still uh, do the cut permute and rewire uh, and produce a sample network from the original network that preserves the in and out degrees of the original network. So the number of outgoing arrows is always the same. So from blue, there's two outgoing, one incoming. Here, there's two outgoing, one incoming, right? So that's preserved. And then we sample lots and lots of this. And then any test statistic 
of this sample you can use to get the p-value. So that's basically the idea. And, um, and then in this case, what's the probability of this sample network with just nine um, thingies? Then the answer is just one divided by the number of edges factorial. So it's one over seven factorial. So then we use this um, because that's basically yeah, the number of possible um, networks. You have. And we can basically do this algorithm uh, in, in a scalable way by doing some distributed sorts and joins. So I won't get into it, but the basic idea is you interpret the output of this Monte Carlo algorithm at scale as producing independent and identical samples uh, uh, of, um, of the retweet networks from the null model, which essentially says that if people were retweeting apathetically, but preserve their rates uh, of uh, the activity levels, then, then um, the observed network should be just as likely as one of these coming from this null model. Right? So anyway, um, that's basically, I don't wanna maybe go into too many details. So the, the, the next thing is, so that gives you a, a p-value. So the next thing we wanted to do was actually, uh, okay, fine, you can maybe reject a null hypothesis uh, that, and then conclude that all well, people are not retweeting apathetically, right? But that's all you can say. So, so now there's some, some meaning in some structure in the data that's not like a random thing. Now, to make sense of this, it becomes very, very difficult, okay? So uh, one way, this is now purely, it's not hypothesis testing now. We are basically ex doing exploratory data analysis to have, say, actionable insights or whatever you want to call it, right? So then one thing we can do is we can take this retweet network and then turn it into another random graph, which we call a geometric retweet network. Okay, so, so we take the directed configuration model and um, turn that's here. This multi is, this is the raw data basically up to this retweet network. Then we turn into a weighted retweet network, just simply put how many edges are there, right? And then we take this weighted retweet network and then convert it into a geometric retweet network with weights that are one divided by one plus the number of retweets, right? Okay, why is one over one? So it, it has a very simple property that we're exploiting between uh, 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 is, is three most elementary random variables, right? uh, Poisson, exponential, and geometric. So, uh, so what the main thing to note here is that in this network, if the integer is high, it means the number of retweets is big. And in this network, the, the you know, the big number becomes a small number, right? So then you can interpret this as, as, as the shorter the path length here, the louder the, the retweet noise here, right? So, and then we wanna basically do this because then we can have a, a whatever, a, you, know, a, you know, a problem that's, uh, that's a polynomial time uh, attackable problem using shortest paths, okay? So the interpretation is in a geometric retweet network, the shortest directed path from A to B is the most retweeted path, okay? Uh, and then the, this random graph basically uh, is a projection, is a model that says that uh, each of these uh, edge weights are geometrically distributed random variables, right? Which is just, uh, you do coin tosses and the coin comes up heads according to this probability, right? Geometric probability. And then the random variable, geometric random variable basically counts the number of tosses until you see your first heads. You know? so, uh, so this is a way of encoding these integers in a probabilistic way. Right? Okay, why do we wanna do this? Uh, then what we can do is that the, uh, so this thing we call is the empirical geometric retweet network with these weights. Uh, between zero and one, which are probabilities. And then uh, we can now look at the most retweeted directed paths, right? Um, so this is uh, born when basically we're trying to marry Jigstra. So this is sort of Jigstra's algorithm for shortest weighted paths. We're sort of mathematically finding a stable kind of, you know, relationship between Jigstra's algorithm for shortest path and the Poisson distribution uh, whose expectation is the random exponential with observed number of retweets as its mean parameter. So there's an interpretation, not that this is anything to do with reality, but it's an interpretable model that can lead to actionable insights through these uh, ideological forests. So I'll, I'll sort of explain what this means now. So, um, so here we basically have this network 
and uh, we have essentially uh, start filling up um, the whole um, retweet network and turn it into this empirical geometric network. Now we, the, the main idea is now landmarks, right? So when we talk about ideological spaces, uh, uh, formally, that means just mathematically, we have to be very precise about uh, what we mean by an ideology, right? So this is more uh, atomically using Richard Dawkins' notion of means, right? These are mental genes that are culturally evolving. So that's the connection to evolutionary biology. So what we are really wanting to say is something, some kind of mean, or actually, uh, uh, and, you know, ideology can be somewhat seen as a, as some kind of a, you know, co co conspiring memes that are sort of being transmitted here. And then uh, the, the fundamental point is that there are landmarks that are sources of these ideologies. And then there are sinks, you know, the cons consumers of these landmarks, right? So that's what I mean by landmarks. So here, this could be landmark one. So this could be all the uh, prolific um, neo-Nazi, uh, uh, charismatic neo-Nazi leaders. So we can say this is like maybe two, maybe 80, 80 different charismatic neo-Nazi leaders will form this first landmark set, right? And then the, the landmark set can be a single time, it just has to be non-empty. So this is another landmark, maybe Louis Farrakhan or whatever, right? So Louis Farrakhan is pretty much the only guy behind the nation of Islam, right? Uh, and so on. So we can basically take a subset of the users in the network, uh, a set of subsets and define them as these landmarks for the ideological, you know, coordinate space or whatever you want to call this. So then uh, we can basically use that and then ask for a particular user, what is the shortest um, uh, directed weighted path uh, to each landmark, right? So for this user, the shortest path is just half to this landmark, and then uh, and then to this landmark, you know, it's this path, right? So um, so the path length is one, and here the path length is three, right? Uh, because it can be any one of the users in the second landmark. So it's kind of important to understand what this thing means. So the, yeah, this is one and then this is three. So that's the shortest weighted directed path length of a given user to landmark set one and landmark set two. Okay, now um, that's enough. So now the other silly assumption here is how do we define distances between these shortest weighted directed path to a set of landmarks, right? So one way to, to define distance between the user plus and the user X is to say that it's going to be given by the sort of Manhattan distance uh, of, uh, of user X to L1 uh, and L2. And then you look at user plus to L1 and L2, and then simply do three minus four absolute value of one minus. It's, 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 it's not ideal, but it's, it's called the Manhattan distance or L1 distance. So you can look at the Manhattan distance uh, between the shortest weighted directed paths from every user to every landmark in this vectorized way, and then maybe use that to, to project this, this object into something that uh, has some kind of tree structure so, so we can have some kind of classification of ideological proximity, right? So, uh, so that's the main idea. So because, because basically you can now, what this induces is that for every user, every pair of users uh, here, we can simply provide a pairwise distance Right, so you basically have a pairwise distance matrix, and then you can use that pairwise distance matrix to build some neighbor joining tree or whatever, some some other you know, basically scalable tree. Um, it's another statistic, uh, and then so this is basically how the empirical geometric retweet network plus uh, distributed multiple sources shortest paths vertex programs. This is basically distributed jigstra algorithm that scale. Uh, can can kind of come together and it can lead to interesting questions because the the sort of more citizen and democratic uh, you know side of this like uh, you know sort of the Walt Whitman tradition that democracy is the state of minds that make up the individuals in the state from that point of view what we are trying to say is that uh, a user can ask var uh, ad jag in Swedish or where am I in English and this operator can actually take uh, take your user ID and locate it in this sort of 
evolving population ideological tree. So, so this distance matrix, right, can be used to produce a neighbor joining tree. But then the problem is there can be infinite distances between pairs of users because there's no way to get there, right? Then when you have infinite distances, then the users belong to leaves of two different trees in this forest, right? So that allows you to actually have absolute echo chambers atomized to the individual now. Now, once you have, so that's a forest. Now, now you can actually simply look at this, this, this construction and look at the, the raw data that's, that's passing, project that into this retweet network, geometric retweet network, and then this ideological forest. And the ideological forests are changing in time now. And you as a user, Twitter user, or whoever, is a leaf node of one of the trees in this ideological forest. Then you can ask, that, where am I in this ideological forest at this point in time? And actually see yourself change the same leaf node, you change from one clay to another clay in a tree, or maybe jump between trees as norms shift at, an, at a much faster rate in society, right? So one of the main reasons for this sort of population ideological tree and forests is to, is to allow uh, theologists that I work with, such as Matthias Gardel, who does field ethnography with fascists and jihadists and so on. So they are, they're asking elementary questions of why are normative shifts happening so fast in, in every society, include the Swed including the Swedish society, where the picture of this Afghan refugee girl went from someone who should be let into the home, uh, taken care of to a Burman, right? It, and it's not, of course, everybody's saying it. Some clades in some ideological forests are actually expanding and, 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 and growing their, their sort of normative views are, are shifting, right? So these things allow you to formally, I mean, at least get some exploratory data analytic insights in a principled way. So that's sort of the, the main reason. And in this particular context of US Southern Poverty Law Center, this is actually a projection of the tree. Uh, each node here has a lot of other users under it, like millions of users under each of this. But at a high level, I'm looking at one tree. Um, in this case, because uh, there's a designed experiment to only study one tree, not uh, everything in Twitter, just the political stuff in, in Twitter in the US. And this is the blue clade for the democratic stuff. This is the red clade for the Republican stuff. And this is the sort of purple clade for people who are, you know, um, sort of equally close to Bernie and, uh, and, uh, and Trump in some sense. Okay. Uh, so from the distance between every pair of users based on a given set of landmark accounts. So here the landmark accounts are the five politicians and each of these sets of the US SPLC defined hate group, right? And the same thing we did for the Swedish election, which I won't have time to go into too much, but we looked at every member of parliament in the Swedish uh, parliament, Twitter account, and then uh, is a very, very complicated experiment designed by anonymous data scientists, citizen data scientists who, I don't know, um, take identities in Twitter to, to find out deep hidden parts in Twitter. And so we had about 400 different users we were following across the Swedish uh, extremist diaspora, right? So this is various types of fascists and jihadists and so on and so forth, right? And, and, and all types of other people. So that kind of experiment uh, was designed and the data was created for Sweden and then one can produce similar ideological trees and so on. And that data is hydratable. That's kind of what I'm trying to get to. So there is a whole bunch of Twitter IDs from this very carefully designed study with cleaning up because there was a porn bot infection and at that time in, in Swedish Twitterverse and lots also, and then the data was done by the summer math camp students and you get the tweet IDs. So then any researcher can take those tweet IDs and rehydrate the data, right? And then have it for their own analysis. Um, so that's kind of what would be nice if, if somebody in NLP who knows Swedish <laughs> maybe takes advantage of. So anyway, this is a quick summary. So this is the population ideological tree and degrees of separation. Uh, and this is sort of the top part of the tree. Uh, each, each clade here is, is actually a, a node ID is for this internal branch with lots more leaves. There are 42,853 leaves underneath this particular clade and so on. And then each of this uh, has, um, you know, what percent of the population is in that clade and they are like uh, one degree of separation from Donald Trump, one from Hillary Clinton. Uh, and then this is um, Bernie Sanders, Paul Ryan, Ted Cruz. And this is uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, white nationalist, and so on. 
paid player. So you can kind of see that there is a sort of, you know, it, it kind of makes some sense. Um, I don't want to get to too much <laughs> bogged down by this. So we were able to do hypothesis tests and uh, we were able to, for example, answer the question number one, um, which essentially is uh, the relative frequency of retweets by any one of the hate groups or their leadership for any original tweet made by one of the politicians, right? Uh, so, the, so we are after the null distribution of the test statistic under the apathetic retweet network model. And uh, this is basically, um, yeah, the test statistic simply the relative frequency of retweets. And what you can see is that uh, this is sort of the, the, the observed test statistic, and this is the, um, the sort of confidence interval, right? It's a sort of very basic, uh, whatever, 99, 95% uh, confidence interval for this. So if the statistic is, uh, is, is outside this, then we reject them out, right? And this is actually a vector value test statistic. So this actually, it, it's one, you know, because you know, there's no multiple testing. So, so, so these numbers, one, these, these numbers are one vector. And then this is basically the marginal confidence interval for each. So it's just outside. So then you can say, okay, I, um, so I, I basically, uh, it's outside the acceptance region at the significance level, so I, I reject them all. So there is some, some kind of signal in the data. Uh, what about the number of unique? So this is the other the statistic. So what about the number of unique users who retweeted a politician and a hate group at least five times each? This is a, a statistic, uh, I mean statistics. So now we can ask, you know, is it inside the, the sort of acceptance region or, or um, you know, should we reject it? And, and once again, it's very difficult to visualize these things, but the y-axis is the number of unique users who retweeted a politician and a hate group at least five times each. And this is in the log scale. And then these are the uh, sort of the landmark sets. Okay. And then for each, uh, each politician, you have a picture, right? So you can see that Donald Trump's um, is dominating over sort of, um, yeah, all these ideologies. It's, it's a bit, bit difficult to really, you have to really zoom in and look at what's happening with black separatists and so on. Um, so once again, you can have the null distribution of the test statistic uh, under the apathetic retweet network model. And this is basically one way to summarize the results of the test statistic. Uh, so the observed frequency of distinct users who retweeted a politician and a leader of within a hate group at least five times each is, is what's shown here before the colon. And then uh, this is what you would uh, expect uh, uh, for the confidence intervals for the um, region of acceptance at the one over a thousand significance level. So which means we had to do uh, 10,000 Monte Carlo simulations of this cut per mute rewire algorithm. And then and the nice thing from a sort of computational point of view is once those simulations are done, then you can essentially use it for a, a, a whole bunch of test statistics at once. Um, I think that question three was essentially about population ideological trees and degrees of separation. Um, so I think I said enough about this. Uh, and then you can kind of look into the joint degrees of separation and things like this. So the, the social psychologists are quite curious about, about different kinds of hate. So they really want to understand why someone is exclusively anti-Muslim, but not anti-LGBT and vice versa. So you can descend deep into every single individual in these, in these forests. So uh, I don't know, the, I, I don't know if they published anything out of it, but. So this is the significant statement. Uh, during the 2016 US presidential election, there was significant debate on whether Donald Trump's campaign was fueled by hate and bigotry toward minority groups. We analyzed nearly 22 million communication events on Twitter to better understand the networks of retweeters of American hate groups and five key American politicians during the late stages of the election, Trump, Clinton, Sanders, Cruz, Ryan. Our data reveals that Twitter users linked to various American hate groups, including anti-government, anti-immigrant, anti-LGBT, anti-Muslim, neo-Nazi, and white nationalists were more strongly linked to Trump over any other politician. On a seemingly highly hopeful note about the American people, in my opinion, only a small fraction of those within three degrees of separation from real Donald Trump 
during the nine week period or also within three degrees of separation from any hateful ideology. But of course, you, everyone saw on TV, even, even if there's thousand people, they can storm the capital of a democracy. So it, it's, a, it's not a zero number, but it's a small fraction. And you know, the trolls, the trolls from Russia have an effect on our test. Well, is, the, the whole analysis of trolls is a separate talk, but basically we treated the trolls or whatever they are as, as, as undetected, uh, undetectable at the time uh, mark of control operations done by any agent, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, but the point is it affects interactions. So if, if it affects interactions, then we are just studying what's happening, right? But then we also went back retrospectively and, 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 and asked this question, the 2,752 Twitter accounts identified by Twitter as being tied to Russia's internet research agency troll farm. Uh, well, the answer is no via a non troll subgraph robustness check you can get into this uh, but so out of the 12,984,331 retweets in our database set less than 0.1% were related to a troll account so 293 were retweeted by and 12,347 were originally tweeted by a troll account and out of uh, 2,451,081 distinct users in our retweet network only 172 were related to a troll account so interestingly, the removal of these troll related retweets from the retweet network did not alter the statistical tests. Okay, so it's because our study is very, very huge. Uh, and trolls are just, I don't know, possibly, if, I don't know what the Russian agency did, but if they're just trying to shift people who are on the edge further, like Cambridge Analytica's plants. So those are very specific kind of ideological forest operators. So you wanna change the clay population sizes. If they did anything like it, uh, it, it didn't matter for our study because our study was focused on the sort of extremist files angle. So we were much more interested in those who are on the, on the ideological extremeness uh, space, right? So we had a representation of the population, but our interests were, were different. So, so a, a, a really good uh, Russian internet agency troll farm if that existed would not focus its efforts on our data set because they will actually go after converting others because these were, you know, anyway, it's sort of uh, not, we, we don't know, we can't say what really happened. So I'm not gonna go more, I think I should stop. So we did the stuff, same stuff for the UK election and we got a British population ideological tree as well. This is all British politicians and bloggers. And uh, so I don't know, a lot is happening now. Uh, I think for me, what would be really great is maybe if people are interested, it could be interesting to try like a data science bootcamp for researchers or PhD students. This has been done in the past. We uh, sort of organized courses with people in geography and, and computational sociology in the past. It might be fun to do something in computational linguistics and, and, and sort of big data, whatever. And if people are interested, then we have to kind of plan for it now-ish so we can apply for funding from say the Center for Interdisciplinary Mathematics or something like this. So there's time for, uh, that's, one thing, and, and for me, it'll be really great to create like some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of collaboration and interaction before another four years pass, because <laughs> I've been in the South for some time, and uh, that would be that would be really cool. Okay, so the polarized state of the Swedish political Twitterverse is basically a summer map camp report. I think I've sent these links. They're corrected now in the announcement, so you can read it. It's just me and a bunch of undergrads, like you know, 19 to 21 year olds. Uh, we did a bunch of stuff, and that was quite a lot of work. Actually, it's 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 a lot of human programming hours that went into it, and that's what I'm I'm hoping that you know people who are interested in, in studying the Swedish Twitterverse, because uh, it has Swedish language to, tweets we we collected. And uh, it, you know, it might be, it might be something. Um, let me just quickly do this in two minutes, and that's enough, so you can look at this in detail later. So this is the summer map camp 2019 report. Um, Agnes, Albert, Emila, Andreas, Klaus, Johansson, Magdalena, and then myself and uh, uh, PhD student in math, Tilo Wicklund. At the time, we were the sort of instructors for the summer map camp. So this was a. Uh, yeah, so yeah, this is uh, Swedish Twitterverse. So, and then for this, the, the, it was heavily funded by uh, AWS, Databricks, a bunch of corporations in the US on the cloud computing infrastructure end and uh, sustained by some currently, yeah, some, some VR grants I have with uh, 
geologists, but, uh, and also uh, the company Combion Mix provided uh, infrastructure and so on. So there's a lot of um, stuff done. There's 91 million tweets cleaned and collected. And uh, so Simon Lindgren is a sort of digital sociologist, Numio, who sort of helped a lot with the design and, and Matthias Gardel personally, <laughs> he's, a, he's an interesting geologist here in Uppsala in English Park. Uh, so I think his field ethnographic insights were crucial to ensure that the experimental design is mathematically meaningful and interesting, right? So in that sense, it's an interesting um, study and design, I think. Um, yeah, so we, we don't, I don't want to go into this. Basically, uh, we want to get the structure of the Swedish Twitterverse um, and, you know, do, there's a lot of language filtering done because there was a K-pop epidemic. Uh, so anyway, when I say K-pop, this is weird things happen on Twitter and things happen and then you basically have to do so much cleaning. So we did a lot of very simple high frequency filter cleaning, things like this. And uh, so that sort of hard work is done. Um, yeah, and then they, you know, they did very simple vertex programs to do community detection. So from the retweet network. So just as a starting point, right? And then people can actually use this clustering to, to, to sort of make sense of this. And then uh, the, main, the main idea, just I described in the clustering algorithm, but the main idea is that we have sort of three Swedish clusters. Um, and um, I think, I don't remember the details now, but it's basically one is the left, so-called left and right. I mean, it, it's, it's more complicated because, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's quite different. And um, so this, I think, is the Swedish acronyms for parties. I think KDM, maybe this is Sveria Demokraten, I don't know. So yeah, so this is basically the clustering uh, distribution across the parties. And so it's more, yeah. So we did some basic non-parametric tests and then looked also at the consumption patterns, like what newspapers and... So there is actually a lot going on if you know Swedish and you know NLP because each user, right, has URL entities and hashtags and all that information is preserved in beautiful tables. So that means when interactions are happening by retweets or whatever, you can also look at what are the URL entities that they're sharing among each other. So there's a parallel network of information consumptions and, and, and you can actually even look at who owns these companies like different newspapers and stuff. Right? So, so there's a, a fair bit of information there. And of course, the reply tweets and coded tweets, they're all there in the data set. So you can actually do NLP on it and we haven't looked at any of that stuff. Uh, so this is some hashtag distribution. And so this is all very simple statistical analysis of this clean data. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna stop now. Um, so yeah, the overall conclusions here was uh, clustering captures political affiliations. The clusters use different news sources, uh, different distributions of hashtags and URLs. Um, yeah, so we intended to look closer at the content of the tweet text itself, but I think this is really for people that are, you know, maybe in your department or something. Uh, it would be really great. And I would be more than happy to, 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 to plug researchers into the, into the computational infrastructure you need to do this in a scalable way. Uh, yeah, so this was yeah supported by so we did a lot of things on prem as well, so you know, so you, you kind of need on prem rigs if you want to I don't know. Um, yeah, so the idea was that everything we do uh, is, 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 of course, mathematically precise what it means and all the, all the assumptions are clear, but of course it should be one should be able to take these Intel NUX put them in a steel briefcase and then, you know, take a flight somewhere with solar panels and set up your station to possibly, you know, cultivate ideological forests that affect your livelihood, right? So that's sort of, um, I mean, that's sort of the, the operations research angle and motivation. So I'm going to shut up now. Uh, yeah, there's members of parliament and things like this. So uh, I have, you know, I know we have five minutes for the official discussions, but I, I can be here as long as uh, people uh, want. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm done, Sarah. Um, yeah, thank you very much. We actually have 20 minutes. It's until 2.30. Oh, so. okay. That's great. So yeah. should I continue with the recording or? Yeah, so if we're going into the discussion session, maybe it's better to stop, stop the, recording. the recording and yeah. Uh, stop recording.